Um, so for those who are not familiar with IDMH, um, we do a lot of trainings. We have a big annual conference, maybe some of you have been to, and we've been working with both um, State Department of Health and Office of Mental Health for many, many years, I think going on about a decade at this point. And one of our goals really is to just strengthen training and preparedness for the inevitable disasters that you know we know are going to occur in our state, unfortunately, or if you're preparing to respond elsewhere. Um, so we thank you for joining us for this training in psychological first aid. Again, this is something we've really been working on. I would literally like to get every state employee trained in PFA. So thank you for making time for this today. We will be offering this again. Um, later, uh, actually in June, along with several trainings on building resilience and um, coping capacity. So this one is really aimed at helping other people. The other training on resilience is really aimed at building your own uh, capacity for, for dealing with stress. So they really complement each other very well. So we'll give the dates for those at the end. And if you either want to recommend this one to colleagues or attend the other one, um, we'll give you those dates so you are able to do that. We are wanting to make sure that everyone who participates gets credit for it in the learning management system. So we're trying a new approach to that this time. So we do have this QR code, which I'll show kind of midway through and then at the end as well. And my colleague, Andrew O'Mara from IDMH is also providing backup support. And so he's gonna drop that in the chat periodically. Um, so please do make sure at some point you click into that and just enter the fact that you are here so that you do get that credit. Okay, um, just one housekeeping thing. I'm not generally going to be monitoring the chat, except maybe at a couple of points where I ask specific questions. And at the end where we, we should have some time for Q&A, um, because I get very distracted, but Andrew is going to be keeping an eye on that for me. And if there's anything that's like time sensitive, he is going to break in and just let me know that there's a question I should address at that moment. Otherwise, we'll save that probably more towards the end. All right. So just some acknowledgements. Um, this training was developed now five years ago. It doesn't seem that long, but of course the pandemic has distorted everyone's sense of time, I think. But basically this was developed by myself and my colleagues at Institute for Disaster Mental Health with a lot of collaboration with other people who have done trainings in this field, subject matter experts, et cetera. And so the reason this is branded with Office of Mental Health logos is OMH basically funded the development of the training, but now this year and in most years, DOH is funding the delivery of it. So it really is that kind of collaboration, which I think is very useful. Okay, so why train in PFA? Um, I feel like I used to need to justify this a little bit more than maybe I do now post pandemic. I even feel weird saying post pandemic, but at this state in our recovery from the pandemic. But I'm sure that we are all aware that, you know, disasters are sadly not infrequent events. And some of that is due to the rise in human caused violence, um, all of the mass shootings that have been going on, including the one in Buffalo last May. Um, and then also a lot of more intense weather events, often very tied clearly to the increase in climate change. So hurricanes reaching areas of our state that didn't previously get impacted as much, um, all of the winter storms up north and western state, Buffalo in particular. So probably no one is going to be surprised by the fact that disasters are likely to happen at some point in our communities, in our state. And not surprisingly, I think there's more awareness of this as well, that, you know, it's not just the direct survivors, you know, the communities where the event actually unfolded that need that mental health support, but there's that kind of ripple effect. Um, so it's the, the directly impacted people, but it's also their families, their communities, their workplaces. And then, of course, we always want to recognize the impact on the responders and for purposes of this training, I'm going to define responders very, very broadly. So, of course, that involves official first responders, you know, firefighters, law enforcement, EMTs, healthcare professionals, mental health professionals. I include educators, librarians, politicians, you know, anyone who's going to have any role in supporting people in coming through these events. So I will officially consider every single person in this audience to be a responder. And that means we need to recognize the toll that doing this work can take on ourselves, as well as on the people we are trying to support. And then a lot of what I'll get into much more detail on is 
just um, you know, planting the seed right now, I just want everyone to understand that when people go through a really difficult experience, not only does it impact them psychologically, emotionally, but it really impacts their ability to function. Um, in particular, their ability to think clearly, to make decisions, to choose, you know, to participate in their own recovery. Um, we know very clearly the effect that trauma has on people's minds and brains and bodies um, is all encompassing in many cases. And so part of what we're gonna try and do with setting up the background for psychological first aid is just really understanding or helping you understand why people act the way they act, because that can make you bit more effective at dealing with them when it might seem like they're not behaving you know, rationally under typical circumstances. Um, and also if you're able to address those earlier responses, in many, many cases, we know that that's gonna be all of the intervention people are gonna need. And that can kind of kickstart people's natural recovery processes. So really training responders in psychological first aid is kind of like a force multiplier in the field. You know, if you can get out there, help people in your community, or if you're deployed to an event, you can address those really immediate short-term needs. In many cases, that's kind of all the support the person will need and they're not gonna go on to need more professional support. So again, I'll elaborate on that point in a moment. So we always describe psychological first aid as a universal intervention. Um, and that is relevant in a couple of different ways. First of all, it means that it can be used to help anybody, doesn't matter their age, their education level, um, you know, what, their specific impact of the event has been. Um, so, you know, we want to think of this not as like a targeted intervention that only some people are going to get, but a more kind of basic support that we're just going to offer to everybody because we think it's likely to help everybody who reaches it. And it's fairly, you know, low resource in terms of what's involved. Um, so we want to do it as early as possible, as I said, to kind of prevent those more extreme reactions from occurring. It also can be used at any time throughout the response, but we do know the earlier we can do it, typically the better, because again, we wanna, you know, we're taking that kind of preventive approach to this. Um, so sooner we can help people, the more effective that is likely to be. And just to keep this in mind, it's not so much what we're doing specifically, although we will get into what we're doing using PFA, it's more just what, you know, how you are treating the people you're interacting with um, what is your attitude in terms of being a responder, in terms of understanding what they are going through? We also want to recognize this is not a magic cure-all. Um, it can help a lot, but it's not going to solve everything in somebody's life. You know, really what we're focusing on is this idea that, I'll use this analogy constantly, but, you know, someone was functioning at some level, this was, you know, their baseline, people, some people have a higher or lower level of functioning, an event happens, typically there's going to be some either decrease in functioning or increase in stress, depending on how you want to think of it. What we're trying to do with PFA is get them back to where they were before the disaster, before that traumatic experience, um, not to fix everything in their lives. And so it really is just focused on what is this one intervention you might have with someone and how can you make the most of that in order to provide that support. So PFA is also universal in the sense that anyone can learn to use it. Um, so I think, you know, really analogous to medical first aid. So if yeah, here's my here's my little story that I always use for this. Um, but, it, you know, if you have gone to your local Red Cross chapter or wherever, taken a, a, a first aid course, and so you have some basic skills, you then are able to respond to needs at a basic level, right? So if I, here's my little story, if I am inside my home and I hear a noise outside and I go out and I find that my neighbor has been riding past my house on her bicycle and has fallen off and has scraped her knee pretty badly, I can use my first aid skills to clean that wound so in hopes it won't get infected. I can bandage that wound. And hopefully, in many cases, that's all of the medical intervention that she's going to need. Um, because at that point, it's not like the wound 
has magically gone away, she's still going to have to spend the time going through that healing process. It's still going to hurt for a while. There's still risks that it might get worse rather than better. But often, typically, that is kind of all of the support that she's going to need. So that's great. And I've, you know, done a good service by applying my medical first aid skills in that situation. But I also really need to recognize those limits of where my first aid class has taken me. So if my neighbor didn't just scrape her knee, but she broke her leg, that is well beyond what I am equipped to deal with. So at that point, the best intervention I can provide for her, recognizing the severity of her injury, is to call 911 and connect her with emergency medical professionals who actually know how to give her the help that she needs. So same equivalent here. You might be responding to an event and it might be clear either because of the intensity of the event, the person's exposure to it, you know, whatever the specific circumstances are, it may become apparent to you that this person needs a lot more than psychological first aid. In that case, the best thing that you can do is figure out what are professional mental health services that you can refer them to and make that connection for them. Similarly, um, if, you know, I might've done the best job that I possibly could cleaning and bandaging that wound, but maybe my neighbor has some intrinsic immune disorder that I'm not aware of, or, you know, just for whatever reason, rather than healing over time, that wound has gone on to become infected. At that point, again, that's past PFA. She needs professional medical support at that time. So some people who it might seem like all they need is that basic level of care, just because of whatever is going on in their life, their trauma history, other stressors, lack of resources. Some people won't have that kind of natural recovery process over time. So we certainly want to be aware of that and be aware that some people in the longer run might need professional support. And that's nothing that we did wrong. Um, you know, that's not a failure on our part. That is just the nature of this field. All right, so we'll talk about those limitations repeatedly, but I always like to kind of get that planted from the beginning. So here we go again. Um, so just recognizing, you know, this point about what you can and can't do in terms of both comfort and competence. So it's not your job typically to sort of take on more of a mental health role than you are comfortable with or than you are equipped to do. And so that is absolutely fine to draw those boundaries. But in those cases, you don't want to sort of leave the person hanging if you recognize there are those needs. So again, making sure you know who to refer them to, um, reversing the last two, respecting the wishes of people who don't want your help. You know, well, some people have their own support systems. Some people just cannot get into talking about what they are going through yet or confronting it yet because they're just kind of focused on survival. Um, some people don't want to talk to a stranger. So that is absolutely fine. Don't We need to not take that personally in any way. And we also need to make sure that we don't feel bad that we are limited in the ability that we are able to help. Um, you know, you might see that this person has a lot of needs in their life, but you have to remember your job is to kind of help get them back to that baseline and not blame yourself or not feel like a failure in any way that you can't help them with all the stuff that was underlying whatever that baseline was to begin with. And that's not always easy to do. I mean, if you are an empathetic, caring person, you want to address those needs, but just kind of the, the, the short-term nature of PFA, the fact that it is not casework, the fact that it is not counseling, means you need to understand that you're not going to be able to do that. Okay, so before we get into psychological first aid specifically, um, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about what is this kind of wide range of reactions to disasters that people have, because often um, helpers are not fully aware of everything that they might encounter. So I think it's useful to have that kind of background so you're maybe not surprised by when you do encounter an unexpected reaction. So there is this tremendous variety and it's complicated because not only are you going to have those sort of inter, inter individual differences. So each person you're talking to is gonna have a different combination of reactions that they are going through, but there are also intra individual differences. So one person, if you do have contact with someone over time, they might change in what they are 
feeling and how they are reacting. Um, and that's natural as people start to feel more stable, start to understand the full range of losses they've experienced, start to really process what they've been through. But sometimes for the survivor, that can be kind of um, distressing or you know they, they sort of get used to feeling one way and now they're feeling a different way and they don't know how to cope with that. Um, and so just normalizing that for people, um, helping them understand that that makes sense, um, that that is to be expected, that can be a helpful service as well. So I am going to show a bunch of pictures over the next several slides. And here I will actually attend to the chat while we're doing this. So I'm gonna pause on each one for a few seconds. There's nothing grisly or anything, but there are some strong emotions that we're gonna see here. All of these are like journalistic photographs of survivors to various disasters or traumatic experiences. So I'm gonna show each one, pause on it for a bit. And then um, if you want to either just think for yourself or if you wanna post it in the chat, um, please just say, you know, try and name the emotion that you are seeing to show this wide range. Looks like chat is disabled, Andrew. Yep, I just turned it on. So OK, <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. George, thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of very appropriate responses. Sadness, despair, grief, emotionally overwhelmed, numbness, detachment, overwhelmed again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, 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 I will pause on this last picture because I think this kind of demonstrates the point I'm trying to make here so effectively. Um, these are survivors of the Haitian earthquake in 2010, I believe that one was, um, the, the first major one that killed over 200,000 people. I really don't know anything about th these people's story, but I've kind of made up a history for them where the, the woman in the middle holding the baby is in a couple with the man and that's their baby and the other woman's maybe a, a sister or a neighbor or something. And I think you know the 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 expressions on the the one woman's face who's really showing it the woman on the side you know she that is anguish to me that is despair grief you know overwhelmed the other two they're not showing very much emotion right now but I would be willing to bet that doesn't mean they are not feeling just as much emotion as the other person I just imagine them as just being so focused on survival right now that they can't let those feelings come out. Um, and I would you know, bet maybe if you found those same people at a different point in time, maybe the combination would be the opposite. But I think this just so well depicts like sometimes these expressions are kind of externalizing, they're visible so we can see who needs help. And we wanna make sure we don't then assume that, we, that the, the people who aren't showing that much emotion aren't feeling it. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't overlook the people who are not showing it um, because they might be just as much in need of support. Um, but it's kind of that squeaky wheel gets the grease thing where we, it's easy to miss some people. Um, but I hope that range of pictures just shows, you know, again, some of them people were just numb. They just they had no expression or it was just that whole sense of being told totally overwhelmed. Other times, like the, the grief, the anguish, you know, it's very, very visible. So hopefully that kind of depicts how, you know, the, what kinds of emotions you might get exposed to in helping survivors. And it's also, I think, important to recognize that people's reactions are not only emotional. Um, they also can experience reactions in these other realms as well. So behavioral, let's see, okay behavioral expressions, um, those can be things like using drugs or alcohol to numb feelings. 
Those can be things like isolating oneself, overworking, bullying other people, um, not trusting other people. You know, it's kind of ways of trying to control what someone has been through or control their feelings or minimize their feelings and numbing them intentionally through drugs or alcohol, which of course, not great in terms of people being able to participate in their own re uh, recovery. Physical, um, a lot of people do carry their stress in their bodies. I mean, I'm sure every one of us could identify, do you get, are you prone to stress headaches, stomach aches, um, heart palpitations? Um, I, I tend to get a really stiff neck and jaw, like I clench that part first when I'm starting to get stressed out. So sometimes people don't connect those as being stress reactions. So it can be useful to point that out for them. Um, and I also always wanna point out in some cultures, it's more acceptable for people to say, I have a stomach ache than to say I'm scared or I'm upset. So sometimes looking for people talking about physical symptoms might actually be a sign of an emotional symptom that they're not willing to acknowledge as much. The cognitive realm or, or group of reactions, um, these are reactions where basically just, I mean, I mentioned this at the very beginning, because going through something frightening or traumatic or stressful just takes so much mental energy. You know, we often talk about, and you'll get this if you take the resilience training, um, when people are under, under stress, it really, literally what happens is your higher level frontal lobe functioning, your executive functioning gets hijacked by your emotional brain because your emotional brain is in charge of keeping you alive. And so that is a much more powerful kind of functioning um, evolutionarily. And so people who have gone through something distressing, they will say, I can't focus on anything. I can't concentrate. I can't remember anything. I'm losing my mind. Um, so this is an area where just pointing out to them, this is a stress reaction. This makes sense because of everything else your brain is occupied trying to process right now. And then the spiritual reactions can go a couple of different ways. Um, so, so sometimes people who go through something distressing can really take a lot of comfort in their faith um, or their spirituality it doesn't have to be formal religion, but you know, we have all these sayings like, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle, or the, you know, the, the universe doesn't give you more than you can handle, or, you know, this is meant by the universe in some way. For some people, that is comforting, believing in an afterlife, if there's been a death, that kind of thing. For other people, either that's not part of their belief system at all to begin with, or if it is typically part of their belief system, they may currently be feeling not that way. Um, so, you know, why is God punishing us? What did we do to bring this on ourselves? You know, this bad karma or you know, just the, the universe is punishing us. So, you know, I am not personally as a psychologist, I am absolutely not equipped to try to answer those questions, but I think it's really important to understand how significant they can be for people. And so it, that's another case where if I were trying to help someone who is asking, you know, wh why is God punishing us? I'm not gonna try to answer that question but I will try to connect them with a spiritual care provider who might be better equipped to try to deal with that kind of thing because it is such an existential um, question that people are asking at that time. So those are kind of the main reactions that we tend to think about. Um, and you know, I think it's it also shame and guilt are in there as well for many people, you know, um, performance guilt, survivor guilt, the sense that they should have done something different. Those can be very powerful and they're often very kind of distorted in terms of expectations people might have for themselves. So obviously not surprising that these reactions can be intense and distressing. Obviously they're going to be that. Um, and and they're, they're new for a lot of people. You know, many people have never been through a disaster before, or a traumatic experience before. And so people can feel almost overwhelmed by just what they have, what they are feeling, what they're going through. And often people feel like this is their new reality. They're going to feel like this forever. Um, and so sometimes it's helpful to let people know, I'll come back to this with some language I suggest, but you know, we really do know generally over time, even without any kind of formal support, most people will kind of come back to their baseline, particularly once they feel safe again, things start to stabilize again. 
Um, but that can take a really long time. And telling someone that right away is not necessarily a comforting thing because it can feel like you're dismissing the intensity of what they are going through. So again, I'll come back to some language for that in a moment. So again, just recognizing that some people either have been through something so traumatic um, or they have so much other stuff going on in their lives that they really are going to need some professional support beyond what you, if you are not a mental health professional, can probably provide. Okay, so these, first of all, absolutely, you know, having these reactions, these do make sense. Um, we want, we've got a bit of a tightrope act here. We don't want to imply to people that because they're feeling these post-traumatic stress reactions that they have or are headed towards having post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very specific clinical diagnosis um, that smaller percentages than you might think of people who even go through a disaster are likely to actually develop PTSD. But we don't want to dismiss them. We don't want to use the word normal. Um, so this is coming back to what I just mentioned about language. We used to very often in this field use the phrase, you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal experience. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard that. I'm going to encourage you not to use that particular phrase, even though I do think the, the, the meaning behind it is absolutely accurate, um, but using that word normal can feel really minimizing or invalidating. Um, you know, if someone is going through all of these different emotions and behaviors and cognitive and spiritual, et cetera, symptoms, we don't wanna say, oh, that's normal um, because that just feels like you don't understand what I'm going through. So instead, I like to use this kind of three-part response when, when trying to provide that kind of psychoeducation to people, helping them understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling. Um, so, you know, acknowledge the intensity of what they're feeling. So, you know, might say, you might say something like, like, you know, clearly you are feeling a lot of stuff and, you know, it, it makes sense that you are experiencing all of these different reactions given the intensity of the disaster or the experience that you have gone through. So, Step one is you want to validate it. You want to normalize it without describing it as normal. Step two, you want to say something like, you know, it, it makes sense that you're, uh, makes sense you're feeling this way. Most people do start to feel better over time, um, you know, as time passes, as they start to get back to a routine, as they start to feel more stable again. Um, so that, that part two, you're sort of setting up that expectation of recovery without, again, minimizing what they are going through right now. And then step three is saying something along the lines of, but, you know, if you're either not feeling better after a little time has passed, or you feel like you want to talk to someone now, here's what you can do about that. And then making that referral, making that connection, letting them know about whatever resources might be available in the community, et cetera. So you are validating, you're setting up the expectation of recovery, but you're also acknowledging some people are going to need more help and there's no shame in that. Um, there's, you know, there's no reason that they should hesitate to seek that help if they do need it. Okay. And then, and here's what they can do about it. All right. I hope that all makes sense. Okay. We'll just pause again um, for anyone who came in a moment or two late. We do, we do just want to make sure we get your attendance marked off. So if you have not done this yet, if you could just do the QR code, or I know Andrew's dropped it into the, the Q&A or the chat a couple of times, and I'll do it one more time at the very end. Okay, so coming to psychological first aid itself. So there are a number of different definitions. Um, this one's more than 20 years old, but I think it holds up just as well as any. So this is from the National Institute of Mental Health. So evidence-informed and pragmatically oriented. So evidence-informed is reflecting the fact that we can't really claim using PFA for survivors is evidence-based because to do that methodologically, not to go all psychology professor on you, you really need to do like randomized controlled trials where you divide groups of people and some people get it and some people don't. And ethically, we don't do that typically with disaster survivors because we wanna help everybody. And as we'll see also, the whole point of PFA 
is not that it's delivered in some standardized way like a medication, it's always customized to the individual. So that means it's really hard to make those claims about something being evidence-based, but everything points to the fact that it is helpful for many people and certainly not harmful for anybody, essentially. Pragmatically oriented, um, it is very practical in nature. And um, so, so, I mean, I always describe it more akin to social work than to mental health counseling, certainly than to psychology or anything like that. We're really looking at people's basic practical needs. Um, so early interventions, I've already talked about the, the reasoning for that. Addressing acute stress reactions, that's the, you know, they're responding to what they've been through, getting them back to baseline. Um, and survivors and responders. So, you know, it goes back to what I said about universality. A few other just things to keep in mind. This is not a process. It's not a series of steps that you go through. Um, it is a bunch of tools in your toolkit. And so your job as a helper is to figure out what does this person need at this particular time in their experience, given the particular resources available. Um, so it doesn't matter what order you use them in. Um, so don't get hung up on like, you have to do this and this and this. It would almost be nice if that were the case, but it does require that flexibility. Certainly, you know, it, it, when I start getting into the elements that we're going to talk about, you know, you might be thinking, well, in my professional role, I would absolutely never be involved in helping someone with that side of thing, things, but I still think it's useful to go through all of them so you can see what else other people in the response might be doing, and you never know if you're responding to someone not in your professional role. Um, and I mean, I don't think I said this, but I'll also just note, PFA is not just for disaster survivors. PFA, I find really helpful, some of the elements for anyone who's dealing with stress or distress or anxiety. Um, I use PFA constantly with students who are, I'm trying to talk down from being overly anxious about something or, you know, an upset colleague or my husband or, you know, anyone in your life, you may find some of this to be useful for. So it's not just for disaster response. So these are the, um, the elements that we are gonna talk about. There are some different models out there. So don't be thrown off if you come across like an app. There are some, some good apps out there. Um, National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder has a great app for this. They use slightly different language, slightly different steps, um, but we're all trying to kind of accomplish the same thing. So these are the ones that we use in kind of the, the New York State PFA model. So I'll go through each of these in turn. And, you know, you may be looking at these and sort of thinking, obviously, these are things we would be doing to help someone in distress. Um, and that's absolutely true. I mean, a lot of this is just common sense, but there's kind of a saying that common sense isn't always common in disasters in particular because things are so chaotic and you might be feeling pulled in so many different directions. So this is why I do think it's important to train just to kind of get this kind of reinforced in your mind in terms of what you might do. Okay, so kind of going through each of these. So being calm, this is really more the action that you need to do internally than what you're doing for the person that you are helping. But I'm sure we're all aware of how contagious emotions can be. Um, you know, we literally have these mirror neurons where, you know, because we've developed as social animals, we, we pick up on people's facial expressions, tone of voice, body language, you know, how many times have you been talking to someone and you realize you both have your arms crossed in the same weird way or something. Um, so it's the same with emotions in, in addition to that kind of body language stuff. So part of what you need to help do or, or really focus on doing is staying calm for yourself um, because especially if you're in kind of a chaotic collective post-disaster environment, there may be a lot of people who have a lot of strong emotions going on. And so if you can stay focused, then especially when you're interacting one-on-one -on -one with someone, um, sometimes that mirroring can kind of bring them down. But it's really, really hard not, maybe some of you are better at it than I am, but you know, if I'm not really conscious of this, I can easily pick up on the distress or the anger in particular of someone that I'm dealing with. And so, you know, I need to, I try to sort of train myself to like, 
breathing in particular. Like if someone is breathing really rapidly and shallowly and I catch myself doing that, training myself to just take a deep breath, training myself to keep my tone of voice quiet, et cetera. So um, just focusing on being kind of that calm point in the room and then hoping that that will sort of spread to others rather than you taking on the anxiety. Not always easy to do. Warmth and genuineness. Um, so part of PFA is sort of founded in um, mid 20th century, if any of you remember a psych intro to psych class or something, Carl Rogers, um, uh, positive regard for people. It basically, I think that what we were trying to do with this is just kind of staying calm again, um, being warm. And a lot of this, wait, let's see if I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, one second. Okay. So part of this, sorry, is just um, thinking about if these roles were reversed, how would you want the person to be interacting with you? Um, because, you know, it can be very easy, I think, to sort of unintentionally slip into a bit of feeling judgmental of people who have gone through something difficult, not because you're really judging them, but it's sort of a control mechanism. Like if you are talking to someone and you're hearing, well, they didn't follow the disaster warning or they made this choice or that choice, it's really protective, self-protective to think, well, I wouldn't have made that choice myself. Therefore, I will never be in this situation. But you need to really catch yourself and not let that happen um, because you don't know that. I mean, today you are the one who is the helper and they are the survivor, but tomorrow, those roles could be reversed. So I think just in that sense of warmth and genuineness, really keeping this in mind of how would I want to be, if I were the, the person in need of help, how would I want to feel this person was judging me or treating me or respecting me or not respecting me? Um, because if you're not being genuine and actually respecting them and giving them credit for getting through what they went through, they are likely to perceive that. And then that's gonna kind of break whatever kind of trust they might have had in you. So again, some of this is just staying calm, keeping your voice soothing and quiet, not ele elevating loudness to be heard, but you know, trying to bring everyone down. Body language, um, this can be tricky as well. You know, Ideally, if you are talking to an individual, can you get at the same level with them? So you're not either, you know, looming over them or, you know, weird power dynamic there, facing them directly, not, you know, sideways with your legs crossed against them, but just, you know, these things just kind of, even if we're not conscious of them, they do show that we are, it can be really hard. Like if you think about if you were responding in a crowded, um, you know, point of dispensing, emergency room, family assistance center, any kind of collective, response area where there's a lot going on, it's really hard to stay focused on the person you're talking to and not have your attention get distracted all the time. So trying to stay with that. Um, making eye contact, usually we think of that as kind of a sign of respect for people, um, that we are kind of equals in this relationship, but that's not the case for all cultures or some individuals are less comfortable with that. So just you know, kind of take your cue from the person you're talking to. Um, yeah, and again, just staying focused and sometimes that might mean finding a quieter place, taking someone outside, um, turning, maybe you need to turn your back to the room so you're not having your attention diverted. Recognizing basic needs. Um, you know, because disasters in particular or crises are often such new experiences for people, they just, there's stuff that needs to be done. You know, people rarely have kind of the luxury of just focusing on their emotional reactions. They also need to figure out where are they gonna sleep tonight? How are they gonna file the insurance papers? You know, all of the other stuff that goes along with disasters. And so sometimes what you might be able to do um, is just help people figure out. And a lot of what I tend to focus on is just prioritizing, um, making decisions. Um, I think this will come up again later in the training, but you know, I've, I've sort of come up with this analogy of a, a brick wall that I like to use where you know, if someone is really stressed out, at least for me, when I'm really stressed 
And it's like, there's all this stuff out there that I need to figure out how to do, but all I can see is the brick wall that's right in front of me. And I can't get through that brick wall of just all of this combination of stuff to figure out, okay, what has to get done. As a helper, sometimes depending on your role, you might be able to kind of break that brick wall down for them into a bunch of different piles of bricks. So they're still gonna need to deal with each of those piles of bricks, but now it's separate things and they can hopefully maybe with some help start to prioritize them. So, you know, if someone's piles of bricks include, are they gonna have to move? How are, how are they gonna deal with their insurance company? They're gonna have to deal with those at some point, but maybe the immediate pile is, are they gonna spend tonight in a Red Cross shelter or do they have friends or family they can stay with? That's the immediate pile of bricks. And so helping them kind of focus on that and then you know, gradually that can kind of chip away so the path becomes a bit clearer between them. Not always feasible again, but a good goal. Certainly if people have any physical needs, you don't know, need medical attention, you know, this would more likely be immediately after a disaster has happened. But really at any point, you know, it could be days or weeks later, sometimes just that um, this can be a really good entry point for people, like a great way to make a connection with someone is to offer them a bottle of water or, you know, ask if they want to see where the food is being served or something like that, um, because that can often just kind of give you a, a, a reason, not, I'm not going to say an excuse, but a reason to make that initial connection and maybe start to open that conversation. Um, sometimes that can lead to people wanting to talk about what they've been through or what they're experiencing now. I will come back to this when we get into empathy. Sometimes it won't, but at the very least, they have experienced the fact that someone is there caring about the fact that they have these physical needs. Because, you know, think about if you remember Maslow's hierarchy, if people are cold or thirsty or hungry, they, they literally can't start to think about anything else until those basic physiological needs are taken care of. Um, and again, it's just a sign kind of of respect that there is help and support that is available. And so I really, you know, if, if we were in person, I would ask, you know, is offering someone a bottle of water, is that a mental health intervention? Um, I would certainly say, yeah, if that makes someone feel cared for and recognized and, you know, make even the tiniest bit of human connection, that certainly is a helpful thing. So safety needs, um, with this, you know, obviously literally we wanna make sure that people are safe and we wanna make sure that you as helpers are safe as well. You know, unless you're a first responder, you really ideally should not be going into say a post-disaster circumstance where there's um, danger going on, but sometimes we just don't know about that. There might be health issues or, you know, after effects of something, but, at the most basic psychological level, we absolutely know that um, until people do feel safe, they cannot start to think about anything else because basically they're in that state of being emotionally hijacked I talked about, that fight or flight response is still going on. And that means they just cannot think about anything. Um, and certainly, especially if you have a, a situation where people are separated from loved ones, particularly parents from children, they are not gonna be able to focus on anything until they get back together. And so unfortunately, sometimes what that means is people might actually get into harm's way because you know they might be getting told that if parents are separated from kids and the kids are at school, they might get a message, the kids are fine, everyone's supposed to shelter in place, but until they're reunited, of course, they're not gonna comply with that totally understandably. So they can get in the way of first responders, they can get into unsafe road conditions, things like that. So we want to encourage people not to do that while recognizing sometimes they're not going to listen in that area. And then the third point about supporting stability, um, that is really more like emotional safety than physical safety. But this reflects the fact that many people kind of need that sense of st stability, predictability, understanding what to expect. And that's particularly true for children, often for older adults, anyone with any kind of cognitive impairment. Um, and of course, disasters in particular are often going to disrupt that sense of predictability and stability. So encouraging families in particular to kind of get back to those routines as closely as they can, that can be very beneficial. 
So problem solving, this kind of goes back to really to the decision making stuff that I was just talking about as well. Um, and, and here again, you want to kind of catch yourself to make sure you're not judging or getting frustrated with someone because if someone really may be struggling to just make what seems like the most basic decision, um, it's because again, their brain is not functioning the way it normally would. And so we need to recognize that and not think that you know they're being dumb or or that they're intentionally trying to frustrate you or something like that. Um, so we want to be supportive of that. Um, but this the second couple of points about incorporating them in those decision making process or uh, processes. Um, this I always like to share this. One of my most experienced disaster mental health colleagues taught me and the IDMH staff what she calls the, the lemonade rule which is basically, you know, I talked before about handing someone a bottle of water and that is a way of making a connection, letting them know people care about them. Well, even better than just handing them a bottle of water, if possible, ask, do, you, do they want a bottle of water or do they want a bottle of lemonade? Or do they want water or coffee or one water or two waters if that's the only option that you have to give them? Because basically what that does is it, forces them to make a decision. Um, and it's such a tiny, minor, doesn't really matter in the scheme of things decision, but for some people, just something as small as that can be enough to kind of remind them that they're not just passive victims in this situation, even though they might feel like that in many cases, but they're not, they have agency. They have some ability to determine their own fate. And so that's what we really want to kind of reactivate um, with this so that then they start to take that over more and more and aren't just kind of being dependent on what other people are telling them they need to do. Validating feelings and thoughts. This is a huge, huge part of psychological first aid. Um, and, you know, so much of this is simply just acknowledging what someone has been through and helping them maybe identify their feelings. You know, if they're still in that early stage where it's kind of this big swirling cloud of emotions and other reactions, just literally helping them name what they're going through can be useful because what someone needs to do to cope with a feeling of sadness is different than what they need to do to cope with a feeling of anger. Both of those feelings are perfectly valid and probably perfectly justified, but we're gonna deal with them in different ways. So first just kind of disentangling them can be helpful and understanding how they will change over time. And then the point about um, people minimizing their losses, sometimes because, especially a collective event like a disaster, you know, even if an entire community goes through the same hurricane, that doesn't mean people had the same extent of property damage or loss of loved ones or pets or, you know, all the other stuff that could come along with that. So sometimes people who have fewer losses, you know, they're, they're kind of lower on the spectrum of intensity, will kind of downplay, you know, they'll feel like they don't have the right to complain about what they've been through because they know other people had it worse. And, you know, yeah, but that doesn't mean they don't have the right to mourn their own losses and feel bad about what they have been through. Um, you know, maybe they don't want to do that directly in front of the person who had much more significant losses, but they still had their own losses. Um, and so giving them kind of that permission, that validation can be helpful because if they don't, you know, if people just kind of suppress that and don't come to terms with it, they're not going to move through that process of adjusting to it and, and, and mourning it. You know, any loss is a loss and people have the right to kind of go through that. I mean, I think a good example of this was during the pandemic. You know, obviously some people had huge critical loss of family members and losses of jobs and all of that. Other people lost their vacation or lost their graduation ceremonies or things. And no, that's not the same, but those were still losses of those experiences. So, you know, everyone needs, everyone has the right, I think, to, to process that in their own way. So first point is essentially what I've just been saying. And here we might get into some of that kind of psychoeducation about, you know, why they're feeling the way they're feeling. We'll get into that more a little bit later. The role of media in disasters or other kinds of public tragedies where there is that kind of public 
interest in what happened. It's really complicated. We could spend an hour just talking about that. But you know, part of it is, um, is sometimes people experience the role of journalists coming in as really intrusive, as really insensitive, as really inappropriate. You know, this is this is our family's tragedy, our community's tragedy. I don't want a microphone being stuck in my face. Other people don't mind that as much, and in some cases, actually want to use the media as a way of spreading the word about what happened of you know communicating how bad this was how much the community needs help um how much i mean this is a, a terribly sad example but you know i remember some of the sandy hook families after that horrible horrible event wanting to talk to media because they wanted people to know that their six-year-old child had been murdered and they wanted that to be in the public attention. So people have really different reactions to this, but as a helper, you might potentially kind of be in a role of helping survivors figure out, do they want to talk to the media? Um, do they want to put their story, their face, their words on the record? Because part of it that's so complicated now, I think is, it's not like in the old days when something would be on, you know, the six o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news or one day's newspaper. And then it was in the past. Now, of course, everything is captured forever. And so do they want that to be kind of the searchable part of their history? Um, so sometimes yes, sometimes no, but absolutely protecting people from media is really important as well. And many journalists will be pretty respectful if there's kind of a, a, a no-go area where media are not allowed it's rare that they'll actually try to violate that, um, but it's not always possible to protect people entirely. Okay, empathy. This is the hardest part of all of this to explain. So I've got several slides on this. I'm gonna to try to get through all of this clearly. So empathy is different than sympathy and people define these in different ways. So you might, you know, what I'm, how I'm about to frame this might be different than how you might've heard this from other sources. And that's okay. I don't think, I, I think these are such complex and intertwining phenomena. I don't think we can do like a bright line between them. But in my take on this, sympathy is really feeling emotions with someone, literally sim with pathos feeling in the Greek. Empathy is more, the sense of being able to imagine or understand or try to understand because you can't fully what someone is going through without actually taking that on yourself. So, you know, here, you know, needing some kind of like invisible force field that's letting you kind of get a sense of it for them so that you can respond sensitively, but you need to not feel their feelings because sympathy is absolutely appropriate if you are talking to a friend, a loved one about something bad they're going through, you know, if you are attached to that person, of course you're going to feel it with them. That is only natural. But if you imagine trying to respond to a whole town that have gone through a disaster's worth, it is a really quick road to vicarious traumatization, compassion fatigue, burnout, all sorts of harmful occupational hazards. You know, if you are taking on all of those feelings, you are not gonna be able to keep doing your work. So you need to figure out how are you going to listen to people's stories if that's appropriate for you to do um, without getting overwhelmed by them. Now, the second point is also really key. So if people wanna talk about what happened to them um, or what they're feeling right now, it doesn't necessarily have to be their whole disaster experience or trauma experience. We never wanna push people to do that. Um, we learned from some of the more harmful earlier practices in disaster mental health, where people would be required to do critical incident stress debriefings um, and asked to go through and exposed to other people's experiences. That turned out not to be very helpful. I know that's a little bit controversial, but um, Sometimes people just can't open up that can't, I don't want to say can of worms, but I will, you know, can't get to those feelings because they're so focused on just getting through because they're not in a place where it would feel emotionally safe for them to start actually recalling what they've been through. 
Um, and so we absolutely want to not push people. Some people even early on do want to do that. Um, some people that's sort of cathartic. It's the way they kind of, you know, understand or process what they have gone through. If that is the case with someone that you are trying to help, think really, really carefully about, are you the best person for them to do that with? Are these the right circumstances? Um, because that's going to be a pretty big uh, interaction if you do, if they do do that, because if someone's really getting into what they went through, that could potentially expose you or whoever you are, they are talking to, to a lot that then, as I said before, you need to figure out how to not take that on. So if it's appropriate for them to do that with you, how are you going to then discharge that? You know, are you going to talk to a supervisor, a colleague, a partner, some way that is going to let you then not internalize that for yourself. It also is entirely, oh, come back to this. Um, if this is something that you are willing to do, um, you know, the, these are good, just basic reflection or mirroring statements. Um, and these, this is, these statements are really useful, not necessarily for someone telling their whole disaster experience, but just any kind of interaction you're having with someone. And these are just ways, again, of validating and of confirming for them that you really are listening. So, you know, it sounds like, it seems like, you know, am I hearing this right? I hear you saying. Sometimes you will say that and, you know, you're kind of reflecting back to them in close but slightly different language what they've said. Sometimes people will say, no, that, oh, you know, no, that's not what I was trying to say. And just apologize. You know, usually people are not going to get too upset about that if you genuinely acknowledge, oh, I'm so sorry I got you wrong. Let's try this again. Um, sometimes people will get really angry about this um, or really frustrated. And, you know, they will say, you're the fifth person that I've tried to explain this to, and nobody is listening to me, and no one is understanding what I'm saying, and forget it, I'm not going to try any longer. Um, then again, there again, you know, that's a real kind of red flag that they're not communicating what they think they're communicating, and that might be something you can help them with, although again, it, you might not be the person to do the, w this with them. So at that point, you know, you might, again, start by apologizing, you know, something, something like, I'm so sorry, that sounds so frustrating for you. Um, you know, clearly, no one is getting what you're saying. That's another kind of reflection statement. But, I, you know, this makes me wonder if maybe there's a, a different way you might be able to explain what you're going through to people, you know, maybe we could kind of work through that or something like that. Um, not everyone's going to want to do that. You might not be the person, but sometimes that could be helpful for somebody. Things not to say, I'm always big on sharing these. So um, don't feel bad, don't cry, don't think about it. You know, all the ones on the left are basically just sort of invalidating saying like, I don't wanna talk about it. Let's change the subject. Um, you know, let, I, I don't wanna hear about it. If you are feeling this way, not it. Um, I know how you feel. And even I understand that that's a tricky one. And I slip into that frequently still, even though I try not to. Because sometimes people will feel like, no, you don't know how I feel. You can't possibly understand what I'm going through. So it can create that kind of barrier or break whatever trust you'd had with them. Um, it's God's will. I mean, certainly, you know, maybe someone in your professional life, um, certainly not in your professional role. But as I said before, if someone is having that real kind of impact on their spirituality, if they are suffering and you're saying it's God's will, that's not likely to be very helpful for them. Um, it could be worse, certainly not a helpful thing for anyone to hear. And then, you know, at least, at least they're in a better place. At least you still have this, at least you didn't lose this. That's a way of kind of trying to force them to look on the bright side, um, which yet again, not very helpful for people. Um, now, I mean, some of these, if somebody says to you, well, at least whatever, or, you know, if somebody says to you, well, it's God's will, God has a plan and you are comfortable Agreeing with that or validating that, that's fine, but you should not be saying those things, even though it's sometimes hard not to use that language. Okay, so if someone has told their story or you've just gotten into a difficult subject with them, you know, ideally you want to help them calm down. Ideally, you want to not leave them alone after that, because for many people, telling that story is going to spike their 
anxiety or spike their negative emotions again. And so the last thing you want to do is let them kind of get to this state where they're worse, feeling worse than they were before that conversation, and then bring them back to it. Um, so if that is the case, you know, and you can hand them off to a, a DMH, disaster mental health helper, spiritual care provider, you know, just someone so that they are safe and not alone, that's great. It also, that last part may be something you do preemptively. Um, you might recognize someone is starting to get into a story that you are that beyond your competence or your comfort level hearing. And, you know, you don't want to just like shut them down right away, but, you know, just kind of say, you know what, I can see that you really need to talk to someone about this. Um, I don't think I'm the best person for you to do that with, but let me connect you with my disaster mental health colleague or whoever you know might be available in that area. Yeah, and this is not an easy part of this, even for people with mental health background. Okay, a couple more PFA elements. Um, first of all, we certainly want to connect people with support systems if they have them. Um, you know, the, we definitely know as much as external help can be helpful in many cases, most people are going to just get a lot more comfort, a lot more um, effective care, a lot more happiness from reconnecting with natural social support networks. But we also want to recognize that sometimes those some people don't have a good social network. Um, and that doesn't have to be a lot of people. That could be one person, a couple people who they know they can turn to and trust. But especially in something like a disaster, you know, that community might have been impacted as well. So people aren't available to help or to turn to the way they would under a more kind of individual sort of traumatic experience. I also always like to point out that social support is not just you know, one size fits all, there are these different kinds. So instrumental support is really kind of the practical stuff. Um, this is, and this would be not so much you as a professional helper, but, you know, figuring, helping the person figure out who to turn to for this kind of assistance. That could be the person who can loan them money so they can stay in a hotel rather than an emergency shelter. That could be the person who could babysit their kids, who can help them go clean up their house that's been flooded. You know, it's the, the practical, tangible kind of stuff. Emotional support is just what it sounds like. You know, that's the person who they trust, who they can let their guard down in front of, who they can turn to, you know, literally cry on their shoulder, don't have to feel, keep up kind of the brave face in front of. Um, and then informational support, that's the type, like as a professional helper, you're most likely to provide, but that's the person who can offer guidance, um, you know, helping people figure out where they're going to, where they should go to start the insurance process, what kind of resources are going to be available. Um, just lots and lots of informational needs that people have. So I point this out just because we want to help people recognize that this in their lives, the source of one of these kinds of support may not be the best at the other. Um, so the person that you trust to take care of your kids might not be the person who you feel you can really open up to about your experience. And so helping people think, not just reach out to social support, but what is it that you need and who is the best person if you have anyone in your life to turn to for that? Because if you try, if you ask the wrong person, it's not gonna be helpful. It's just gonna be a source of more frustration typically. Um, obviously, you know, if people can be physically reunited, that is key, but sometimes just being able to hear someone's voice on a phone is helpful, um, that, especially in the early days, that's going to be a really significant need. And sometimes if you're especially thinking, you know, doing the problem solving thing, helping someone think, do you have a neighbor or, you know, a family member you might be able to stay with so you don't have to bring your kids to the shelter? Sometimes people will say, you know, I... I guess I could ask my, you know, my sister-in-law across town. I know her house is okay, but, you know, I, I don't want to be a burden. Um, you know, I, I don't think I want to reach out to her. Um, sometimes that is just that kind of guilt or not wanting to ask something of another person. So sometimes that question about, well, you know, if the roles were reversed, if it was your sister-in-law who was displaced um, and was facing going to a shelter, would, wouldn't you want, or would you want her to see if she could stay with you instead? Sometimes that'll overcome that kind of reluctance, but we also definitely want to recognize that sometimes people have 
very good reasons for not wanting to reach out to specific individuals. Maybe that sister-in-law has, you know, a partner who you don't want, the, the person doesn't want their kids exposed to, or they know if they call this particular family member, they're just going to get that message of, well, I told you not to live in that area or go to that place. You know, I, I warned you this was going to happen. So we certainly want to respect that people often do have real reasons for that reluctance and not try to kind of overcome that for sure. Okay, information, I, I've kind of talked about this throughout, um, but basically, you know, there's so many questions often, and sometimes this is really just practical stuff. I keep mentioning insurance, but that's a huge burden for people. You know, it's a, it's a second disaster. A lot of times if people have had property damage and if they're fortunate enough that they actually have insurance, that's another battle they're gonna have to help. So just helping with the practical things like that. Sometimes the questions are, much more existential and unanswerable. You know, how could someone have done this? Um, why did this happen? Why my community? And so some kinds of things maybe you can provide answers to, some kinds of things you absolutely will not be able to provide answers to. And, you know, it is really, really important to kind of be sure that you are advocating to get information to people as quickly as possible recognizing that they're not thinking clearly, they're not remembering stuff. So if you can get it to them in writing or in, you know, even just something like posting a flyer with updated information that they can take a picture of on their phone, if their phone is working, something like that is useful. Recognizing using simple language, um, you know, people are not gonna absorb jargon or if you're dealing with a population where maybe a lot of people, English is not their first language, when people are stressed, often they kind of lose some ability in a second language, et cetera. So getting them what they need if you can, but also recognizing you're not gonna be able to get them everything they need. And so getting comfortable as much as possible or accepting you might need to say, I don't know, but ideally you're gonna say something like, I don't know, but let me check with my supervisor to see if there's any more information that's just come in I'm not aware of. Um, I don't know, but I know there's going to be a, a briefing for families at four o'clock in the cafeteria where they're going to release the latest information. Um, you know, I don't know, but something that gives them something else to follow up with or worst case, I don't know. And I'm so sorry. I can see how frustrating that is for you. Um, I don't know. But I do know that, you know, crews are out looking, searching the rubble for survivors, you know, just something that lets them know that you genuinely don't know, you know, you're not withholding information and you genuinely do validate how desperate they are to get that information. Again, doesn't take away their need for the information, but it helps them maybe believe that you're not stonewalling them in some way. So education about stress reactions, this, we use the term psychoeducation, even though I think it's kind of a, an awful <laughs> phrase for it. Um, but, you know, basically this is kind of the stuff that I talked about in the first part of this training. And, you know, feel free to share those lists of reactions with people. This does just normalize without using that word normal. Um, and again, gives them that understanding of why they're feeling, how they're, why they're feeling, why they're behaving the way they're feeling and what they can do about it. So that's really the most important part of that. We want to really focus on kind of good coping strategies for people. A um, couple of other points about this, right? So, so some people, you know, as I said before, they're, they're not ready to think about any of this. They just don't, don't want that information. That is absolutely fine. I do think it's really critical to let parents know that the most common reaction to stress among children is regression. Kids who have been stressed often will act younger they'll lose skills that they have recently acquired. And they'll, you know, they might have tantrums, they might have separation anxiety, um, be acting out, biting, kicking, all of that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, you know, that's the only language a child has to express their distress, but that can be really trying for parents, especially if they're already stressed about their own situation. And now the kids are kind of enacting the worst behaviors that they do. So I think it can be useful just to let parents know 
generally that's going to be temporary, but here's what you can do about it if you're really concerned about your child. All right, last points or last elements. So we do, of course, want to take a strength-based approach whenever we possibly can. Um, and, you know, this goes back to kickstarting someone's agency, helping them not feel like a passive victim. So I really like these questions in the middle about how have you gotten through tough times before or what skills do you have that might help you get through this or what resources do you have? Um, you know, maybe getting people involved in response activities because that gives them that sense of agency and participation and action. And th there's evidence that that is really, really helpful for a lot of people if that is safe and appropriate, of course. Um, but to get, you know, just reminding them they were a functioning human being before this happened to them and now they're struggling to deal with what they've just been through, but they have skills that they can call on. And then we want to talk about um, some coping strategies. So we want to encourage people to use effective coping strategies, which we like to define as things that not only help people feel better, but help them function better. So there's a lot of unhelpful or ineffective coping strategies that might let us temporarily feel better or feel less, going back to the you know drugs and alcohol for numbing or avoiding the issues or things like that. But we really want to make sure people kind of use things that are not going to actually become barriers to their own recovery. But I just want to give the warning that it can be really hard to do this in a way that's not going to be perceived as being sort of preachy or unrealistic. So you want to kind of be cautious in how much you're encouraging someone to get some exercise when they're displaced from their home or things like that. So don't go too far in that direction. Um, I think it's much more useful to help guide people away from some of these ineffective approaches, because a lot of these are things that will be barriers to their recovery and also can become habitual very quickly. So, you know, letting people know kind of the downside to these and just kind of gently guiding them away from them a bit if that is appropriate. All right, so wrapping up, and then we do have a little video example of all of this. Um, as I said before, you know, we're focusing on getting people back to that baseline, not fixing everything for them. I hope everyone's aware, you know, we need to treat people as individuals, um, certainly seeking out training on cultural groups that might be in your community you might be working with is absolutely useful. Um, but I think it's, you know, we remind people of that because especially in something like a disaster, it can be kind of hard to keep track of that, you know, if, if you've got hundred people you're trying to help to not fall into that kind of cookie cutter approach to things can be difficult. And then just as I keep saying, recognizing some people don't want to talk to a stranger or professional, they have their own network or they're just not ready to think about this or, or process anything at all. So some do's and don'ts, just you want to be cautious about what you're saying in terms of over-promising. You know, you want to, you want to help people feel optimistic as much as re is realistic, but saying either just very general, you know, everything's going to be fine, or, you know, I'm sure your missing loved one is okay. If you don't know that that's the case, don't say it. And very specific things as well. I mean, I would say like, don't say yes, FEMA's definitely going to cover you to rebuild your house because FEMA's not going to do that. And so that we want that to be true. It gives people that little burst of hope, but then it turns out not to be the reality. Um, I think I covered the second point plenty, you know, don't, don't make comparisons, do validate, even if it doesn't seem like someone's losses or experiences were maybe as big to you as some others that you've seen. As I said before, that's their losses, that's their experiences, and they need to be able to process that. Don't change the subject, or if someone needs to just sit in silence, don't jump in there with kind of idle chatter. It can be really uncomfortable to sit with someone not speaking, but sometimes that's what people need. They just need to not be alone while they're processing what they've been through. And then the point about anger, so hard, um, because you know, in addition to all the other emotions that we've talked about, often survivors are pissed off you know, the, at, at what happened, at the perpetrator, at authorities, at themselves, at God. So it's almost certain they're not actually angry at you, the helper, but you, the helper, or the person in front of them. And so often they will redirect that. Um, and you know, usually anger is kind of the, the surface emotion that has a whole lot of other emotions underneath it. You've probably all seen that like iceberg image 
So maybe what they actually are is scared or disappointed or frustrated or whatever. It's just coming out as anger. Um, and so trying to recognize that, I think it's helpful to recognize I have certainly been the person who's been inappropriately nasty to a helper in certain circumstances and then felt awful about it, but we've probably all been there. So just recognizing again, if the shoe was on the other foot, um, but mainly what are you gonna do to then discharge that? So if you are providing them the benefit of letting them kind of ventilate those feelings, how are you then gonna turn around and, and not take that out on the next person you talk to? Okay. So we have a brief, good, we're right on time, um, brief video example of this that I will show you. Um, so reminder of what our PFA actions are. So this is a video role play that Institute for Disaster Mental Health filmed several years ago, um, actually for another project on psychological first aid with the um, University at Albany School of Public Health. And so because our target audience for it was public health workers. The subject that we chose in, I think it was 2019 or something like that, was a pandemic outbreak. Um, so this was pre-COVID, but it turned out to be very timely um, in many ways. It's a little bit different though, because the specific form of outbreak that's going on in this scenario is actually a pandemic flu that is very much like the um, 2018 Spanish flu outbreak where the people who are most vulnerable to it are people with healthy immune systems. So in this scenario, it's mostly severest for young, healthy people. And so the um, situation that we're gonna see is a hospital waiting room where um, there is a mother who is waiting to find out how her child is doing. It, this is supposed to be a college town where there had been a point of dispensing where um, vaccines were made available to the students. So the rest of it will kind of unfold. But as we're watching this, please just you know keep in mind these elements and think about what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. And remember, it's fine. What the goal is not to tick all of these off. But what is what is the social worker using with the mother, and how does that seem to be helpful for her or not? What else might she have done? And then we'll do a little bit of chat afterwards um, just to process all that. Okay. It always takes a minute to start up. Hi, my name is Renee. I'm a social worker here. I noticed you look upset. Do you mind if I join you? Thank you. So do you have a loved one who's in the hospital here? Yeah, my uh, my son, he was admitted last night. I've, I've been here. Uh, he's, I've been with him in his room for hours, mm -hmm. but um, they took him for some tests and the nurse suggested that I, you know, go get, maybe go to the cafeteria and get something to eat, but I, I couldn't possibly eat anything. So I decided to wait here. Sorry to hear that your son's sick. May I ask what happened? It might be the flu. Uh, so uh, at least that's what they're testing him for. Um, you know, he's a college student and um, he was fine. And then yesterday he started feeling really sick and practically fainted. And his roommate um, finally showed some common sense and uh, called 911 and they brought him here by ambulance. The son texted me in the ambulance, you know, if you can imagine that. So uh, I drove all night and uh, we got here about two in the morning. Wow, so you drove all night, you must be exhausted. Yes, I am, but I can't really be thinking about myself right now. So worried about Ben, he's all I've got. So it's just the two of you then? It is, but uh, at least I'm here and he's not all alone. You know, who knows how they might have treated him if he were here by himself, you know, all, all, all no offense. None taken. I'm sure it's a great comfort to your son that you're here. Yes. Just struggling really hard not to cry. You know, he hates it when I cry. Well, you know what? Um, your son's not here right now, so you can cry if you want to. May I ask you a question? Sure. I know you're not a, a doctor or a nurse, but you know they gave me all these papers, but I, I haven't been able to get the doctor to talk to me yet. 
do you, it's so frustrating, you know, do you know anything about this disease? Well, that does sound frustrating. I don't know exactly what's going on with Ben. Um, you know, his uh, medical team will be able to tell you more about that. Um, I'm sure they're, right now, they're probably really busy making sure that it gets the best care possible. Um, I do have some um, information the hospital prepared um, about the flu that's going around. Um, so you may find it helpful. Um, there's some brochures. Um, it's in brochure form, so it'll be easy for you to digest. Thanks. So um, it's just hard on the news that for some weird reason, this is affecting young people more than, than older people. How can that be? From what I understand, the flu mutates uh, every year. And so this year, um, it's affecting people mostly with um, healthy immune systems because it's sending their immune systems into overdrive. Um, so a lot of young and healthy people are getting sick. You know, it's, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. It's just that Ben's an athlete. He's never been sick. Um, and the college was making the shot available, but, you know, he said he really wasn't necessary. I, I wanted him to get the shot, mm -hmm. but um, he said it wasn't necessary. And I should have made him get the shot. You know, Ben's a legal adult. You couldn't have made him get it if he didn't want to. Um, but really, a lot of the college students didn't understand the risk. Um, such an unusual virus that's going on right now. I guess. But if what, you know, what you're saying is right, then isn't he in a lot of danger? I mean, he could be in a lot of danger, even of, I can't even, I can't even think about that. You're so fortunate that Ben's roommate um, contacted 911, got Ben here, um, that he could seek treatment earlier. Um, and he's in the best place right now. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the first smart thing that kid has done. You know, I'll have to thank him. But, uh, when Ben is better. You know, you had mentioned um, earlier that you hadn't eaten anything yet. Why don't you go to the cafeteria while Ben's getting his testing done? I, I really don't think I could eat anything. I can understand that. It's hard to focus on anything else but your son right now. But I think it'll help you keep your energy up so that when Ben gets out of testing, um, you'll be able to give him all your support. And yeah. he would want you to eat, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. All okay. right. I think that's a good idea. Okay. While we're going, why don't we stop at the nurse's station? and let them know where we're going to be so that if anything changes they know where to find us all right okay all right let's go okay. and thank you you're welcome why don't we walk this way you got everything i think so okay okay well Okay, so hopefully people were able to see that okay. Thank you, Andrew, for, I see you posted the link to it in the chat. Also, if anybody wants to go back to it, we do have a couple of other of these video examples on the IDMH YouTube page as well that might be good resources if you wanna see more of PFA in action. Um, so what, if anyone wants to put it in the chat or I'll, I can just narrate in our last five minutes, did you see any of these actions being used? Okay, I'll go ahead then. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you know some of them were used. Certainly, the the recognizing basic needs um, in terms of recognizing that the mother had not eaten and helping her come back to that at the end. Yeah, Sarah, thank you. Lots and lots of validation throughout. You know, you must be so tired. That that sounds really worrying. Comfort care for sure. Um, she um, she provided accurate and timely information, right? She gave her the brochure. She didn't, the, the social worker did not step beyond her bounds. You know, she didn't pretend to be a medical professional or anything like that. Um, but she gave her some information in that printed form so that she could retain it and come back to it as she could handle it. Um, yes, Anthony sat at eye level with her. She, and she introduced herself, right? She didn't just kind of like plop down. She sort of said, 
I'm a social worker. Can I sit down with you? So she got, you know, she made her role clear, which is good, and then got that permission. Lots and lots of reflective listening, Kelly. Yes, thank you. Um, she she didn't get much into connecting people with their support systems, although I like to think she probably would have gotten to that down the road. The, you know, the mother acknowledged that she was sort of alone, so maybe that's something she, she would have come back to. Um, recognize, yeah, basic needs, all of that stuff. Um, one of the things, sometimes people react to when the social worker says, you know, you're so fortunate that the roommate called 911 and so Ben's in the hospital. Sometimes people think that's kind of a like, look on the bright side thing. And I can understand how it could be interpreted that way. To me, it, it is realistic. Um, you know, it, it's, she's not, she's not making a promise. She never says something like, oh, I'm sure Ben will be fine or anything like that. Um, she, just says, you know, he's in the place he needs to be. And she also uses that to kind of frame, she acknowledges that it's frustrating that she hasn't been able to talk to the doctors yet, but that's because they're busy taking care of Ben's medical needs. And so again, it's kind of a reframe. It's not that they're ignoring her, it's that they're focused on something else. Um, introduced herself by stating she noticed she seemed upset. Yeah, so she cares and recognized her distress. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, that kind of empathetic connection, I think just the empathy throughout was very appropriate. Even just the things like at the end when she agreed to go to the cafeteria, you know, the social worker said, let's let the people at the nursing station know where you're going to be. So in case they're looking for you like that to me is like, I, if I were in the mother's situation, I would have been worried like, well, if I leave, they're not going to know where to find me and I'm going to miss something. So that's another kind of practical, I don't know if that's an informational need, but just kind of addressing that, that basic kind of thing. So, you know, I, I hope that was kind of a good example. You know, that was a, a six minute long interaction. Um, do, and I would say, you know, even though we are talking about a social worker as the helper in this situation, I don't think she went beyond PFA in this. She was not doing, you know, casework or anything like that. So even though she has, in this case, the helper has that mental health background, really wasn't getting into that. Anyone could have done that exact same level of supportive care for the mother. And, you know, do you think that at the end of that six minutes, the mother was in a better place emotionally and practically than she was at the beginning of that six minutes? I would certainly think so. Um, you know, so I think it just, even though this is manufactured and artificial, obviously, and scripted, I hope this kind of just demonstrates how powerful PFA can be, even though it does seem so simple and so basic and so common sense, we need to remember to do it and to implement it into our care. And as I said, it really kind of has to underlie all of your interactions with those survivors, with the people you're dealing with, with your colleagues as well, because we are just as capable of getting frustrated. Okay, so we are just about out of time. Um, just put this up one more time. Hopefully everyone has completed this already. I will assume that you have. So as I said, we do have several more trainings coming up. Um, couple weeks from now and then several in June. So we are gonna be repeating PFA on June 7th if you think this would be of interest to anyone else. There's also a recorded version of it in the learning management system. It doesn't have kind of the live element, but it's, it's me talking about the same stuff basically. So that is in there. And then we will have three sessions um, on this resilience and stress inoculation, which is a more kind of cognitive approach to dealing with your own stressors and um, building your own resilience. So we've been doing that one a lot. We sort of developed it right at the beginning of the pandemic and have delivered it to lots and lots of audiences. Um, and it seems to be helpful for a lot of people. So if that appeals to you and you haven't done that one before, certainly encourage you to sign up for that one as well. So that is it. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Andrew O'Mara for providing support in the background. And I wanna thank all of you for making the time for this. I know that's not always easy to do, but I really hope it's been helpful for you. Um, this will get processed in LMS. I think it usually takes a few days or a week or so, um, but then that will get approved by Tom Henry, who I also wanna help, I wanna thank at Department of Health. That's it. Thank you so much. Be well. Enjoy the beautiful, well, it's a beautiful day where I am. I don't know about all of you, but thanks. Thanks. I see everyone in the chat. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.